Hello and welcome back to a new video in my CUDA tutorial series. In the last video we got some hands on on CUDA and we saw that indexing an array in CUDA isn't that straightforward and actually that's what we're going to talk about today. Today we're going to talk about the CUDA threading model, how it is built up, how we're going to get to it and why it is as complicated as it is. Well, the CUDA threading model in general is a 3D grid of blocks of 3D threads. Wait, what? So it is going to be explained in this video. Don't be afraid. Let's start by taking a look at what we want to archive. So we want to run as many threads as possible, as concurrent as possible. We have some highly concurrent work, for example, converting each pixel in an image from color to grayscale. And we want to run as many threads as we can for that operation. And we want to run them as concurrent as possible. So in the best case, each pixel gets its own thread that each run, uh, each pixel is processed at the same time. So we just have kind of like the time of one pixel to process. So that is kind of like the goal that we want, the best case. And we also want to have fast memory access. We want to uh, come have some memory that is fast accessible. Well, we archive this with VRAM directly on the GPU. And we also want to have communication between threads in certain cases. So there are cases where we need to kind of like store states and kind of like assert that everything in the thread is kind of like going to the right memory order. Uh, this, we also want to have this behavior, but limited. So not each thread that can communicate with each of them. We also want to make the indexing per thread as easy as possible. So basically indexing means knowing what portion of the shared data uh, we want to work on. So for example, if we have two arrays, A and B, and a second and a third array result, we uh, want to know uh, which index of the array A and array B to take and write into the array result for that current thread. Let's start by taking a look at the most simple execution or threading model that you could have on a GPU. So the most easy thing would be uh, the GPU has n number of cores that can run n number of threads simultaneously. Then the C++ application can dispatch AX threads that run at the same time. So basically, well, we have a GPU that offers a certain amount of cores that each can run a thread. And then when we want to start some work on a GPU, we just say, hey, dispatch that number amount of threads to run that application. This has certain issues, this model. Uh, first of all, we have an issue when the uh, maximum number of threads or cores are exceeded on a GPU. For example, let's say our GPU has 200 cores and we want to execute 400 threads in parallel. doesn't work. So we kind of like need to say first execute these threads then the other threads. But by doing this, uh, our execution is no longer predictable or defined. So basically, if we have shared memory between uh, our executing threads and we write our application that kind of like asserts that all of the threads run simultaneously. If they now no longer run simultaneously, we might have some issues with that. So we are no longer predictable and we don't have defined behavior in certain cases. Also, it scales very badly across different GPU models. For example, you're a developer, you have a beast of development machine with a GPU of 800 cores, for example. So you write your application that uh, exactly requires 650 threads and everything works fine on your system. And as soon as you move to a uh, less capable GPU with, for example, 400 uh, uh, cores, uh, then you have the same problem as explained above and it's no longer predictable and the application may uh, behave uh, undefined. So this is also an issue we can't really scale. Uh, also, the indexing might be a bit more complex or unintuitive. So for example, if you have a linear thread index and you want to access a two-dimensional array, you first need to decomposite these informations to then later on use them on a three-dimensional or on a two-dimensional or three-dimensional array. So you need to kind of like do some yeah, some very bad unintuitive uh, computations uh, or that might even cost memory because you need to do them and they might be unintuitive. So that's also an issue, not the biggest one, but an issue. So let's go one step further. We are now defining thread blocks and each thread block has n number of threads and each GPU has a certain number of blocks it can execute concurrently. Now, the C++ application dispatches 
x thread blocks with n threads each. So basically now we are no longer saying, okay, dispatch that many threads. Now we are saying dispatch that many thread blocks. One thread block, on the other hand, is now a predictable execution environment. The same, has the same shared memory, has the same environment, runs simultaneously and is kind of like a defined behavior. So now we have kind of like split our problems into some blocks that can be run concurrently and cross block operations need to be serialized on the CPU side or you need to do one operations on the GPU first with some memory rollover uh, and then dispatch the second work. So now we have kind of like a defined model where we can say, all right, we have blocks. The GPU knows how to execute a block properly and we just say execute that number of blocks with that number of threads each. Do we have a problem here? Not really, but problem. Uh, when we are using blocks, we are still not able to handle, or handle operations with indexing that might require two or 3D operations. So for example, if we want to go over an image, we still have a linear index. So we have like a block index, a block size and a thread index. But using these three values is always going to give us a one dimensional index. We are not able to handle some two dimensional problems or three dimensional problems that require uh, a two-dimensional or three-dimensional in index. So again, we uh, have now a one-dimensional index and we need to map this again to, to a two-dimensional or three-dimensional operation. And that means that we don't have a way to handle two or 3D operations natively. So we need to always use our own application. And there comes the CUDA threading model in. The CUDA threading model is defined by uh, a block and a grid. And a thread, of course, but a block definitely uh, in CUDA is uh, a block of thread, which is composed out of X, Y, and Z threads. So basically a three-dimensional block, could imagine this like Minecraft, the three-dimensional block would be kind of like if you're building a big Minecraft block, uh, like X, Y, and Z times in the sizes. And each of the blocks inside is a thread. So you have this block composed out of several threads and these blocks are executed simultaneously and blocks itself are dispatched in another unit, in another three-dimensional unit, in a three-dimensional grid. And a grid has also blocks, also X, Y, Z. So to recap, we have a big grid, a three-dimensional grid. Each element of the grid, so each block of the grid is a block and each block has a three-dimensional amount of threads inside of it. Even through we are talking 3D, this is not real three dimensions like on the, on, on the GPU, like if we're rendering, no. Three dimension is just a logical way to describe the work. We have three dimensional indexes in the C's later to use. Uh, we have uh, our full logic in three dimensions, or we can have them in three dimensions. If we set, for example, the Z value to one, we have two dimensions because one always multiplies means just screw it out. If you have times one, you can always like in math cancel out the value because times one keeps everything else the same. So by having uh, Y or Z at one or both of them at one basically means eliminating uh, these values and so reducing the dimensions. So CUDA gives us the possibility to use up to three dimensions. What CUDA also gives us are multiple level of memory. We have a per thread memory. So that's basically all variables that you use inside of your kernel application. So uh, we don't care about that one. It's just the memory that we use. Uh, we have per block shared memory. We're gonna need some special flex in our CUDA code who say this is shared memory. And shared memory will be shared across the full block that we can then use to do some operations or some synchronization between threads. And, but shared memory, we're going to talk about this later on. This is not quite straightforward as all other stuff. And we have global memory. This is the GPU memory that we already used by calling CUDA malloc, for example. CUDA also has some limitations. The limitations are device dependent, but the thing is we can always ask our device and get these limits. CUDA only allows a maximum of uh, uh, 1024 threads per block. 
and it also requires to scale them in X, Y, and Z uh, to the power of uh, of four, I think, was it? I think it was one, four, eight, sixty moon case, what I've uh, read. I think two was not allowed, but I might be wrong with that. I might also have just missed it. Uh, so one, four, eight, just power of, uh, power of one, two, four, like how, how you're always doing it in software engineering. Um, we also have some limitations in, uh, in, in the form of block and grid sizes. This is just an example for, uh, a block size dimension, 1024, 1024, 64. Uh, we are gonna explain this uh, later on in more detail. These are just all example values. We're gonna later on ask our GPU and get uh, some information about uh, how capable our GPU is. And then you can like use this to properly schedule work on the GPU. So how does this 3D indexing in a thread works? We already talked a bit about uh, how this worked in the last video. So basically a thread knows certain properties, exactly four ones for indexing. It knows it its own three-dimensional thread index, which is relative to the block. It knows its three-dimensional block index, which is relative to the grid. And it knows the grid size, also three-dimensional and the also three-dimensional block size. Block size and grid size is constant. So you define when you call your uh, application, you define how big a block is and you define how big the grid is. And by doing that, you basically give some, 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 some bounds. So you give a grid bound and a block bound and out of that, the GPU knows how many threads and blocks it shall execute. And basically what you have is these constant sizes. They are the same for all threads. You can use them to reference them to build your indices. And then for each thread or and block, of course, so first of all, the GPU kind of like takes all blocks, puts them in a queue. And as soon as one block has been executed, uh, it basically computes, all right, so this is the next block index that we need basically. And then it schedules that on the GPU. And then the GPU for each thread increments like the thread indices. So that each thread has its own unique index and each block has its own unique index so we can identify where we are. I have two examples down here for one example here, one dimensional. We already saw this in the last video. We have the index of the block. If we are going one dimensional, we're just going to use X. So we have an index of a block and the dimensions of a block, which gives us kind of like an offset per block. And then we have the local per thread index, the thread index that we can just add on top of the other values that we just, or the other value that we just computed, which gives us a linear index. We also have an example here for a two-dimensional uh, index. It works the same, just that we have now an uh, independent X and Y value that are computed by like block index X times block dimension X plus thread index X. And the same again for Y. This would give us an X and a Y coordinate. We can also use this coordinate again to compute a global offset. For example, if you are like having a two-dimensional problem, but you still need to map it to a one-dimensional array, then you would basically go in and say, you take the Y, the y uh, coordinate, you multiply it by the grid dimension x and the block dimension x, so basically how long a row is, for example, in an image. Multiply this by the y offset and you get kind of like the offset of the row. And then you add your x coordinate and you are at the pixel you want to access, in case of an image, for example. CUDA also has some uh, constructs to use images natively, but we're going to start by uh, in the next video by doing this with a simple array and we're going to basically use this exact a formula that or equation that I've used here in the two-dimensional example. So how does this map to the hardware? Because like the GPU is an hardware and thus we also need to see and know how this works. So basically uh, a thread is executed by a GPU core. A core list is like the CUDA core everybody's talking about, like the RTX uh, 3090 with its 10,000 whatever uh, CUDA cores. Basically one thread maps to one core and a full thread block maps to one streaming multiprocessor. A streaming multiprocessor, also called SM, 
is kind of like the the execution unit it has kind of like its its own uh its own uh, its own units for registers register files cache memory uh instruction cache all this stuff is inside of one streaming multiprocessor and the streaming multiprocessor itself has 32 threads or cores that can run simultaneously. So basically a streaming multiprocessor has all that stuff that we need for like fast memory access, uh, shared memory, uh, the interfaces to the uh, interfaces with the shared memory, local uh, block memory, instruction uh, caching, all that stuff, all that glory register files that you need on a on a processor is all integrated into the streaming multiprocessor but the streaming multiprocessor has multiple cores that do the computation so 32 of them by default on an nvidia gpu 32 are in one of the streaming multiprocessors so basically you have like your on your cpu you have per core all of the glory of caches all the glory of memory accessing of instruction fetching all that stuff is in the cpu integrated within one core and on the gpu side you basically say all right we are just putting all that glory once per multiprocessor but we are adding multiple cores so that we can run the same program on multiple data so we are again here at simit single instruction multiple data and now you would ask me and say wait a minute you told us that we can run uh, 1024 threads in a block but there are only 32 cores Yes, that is correct. Uh, threads are always grouped in a warp. A warp contains 32 threads. This is kind of like one execution unit. But all of our warps are handled by our, uh, our streaming multiprocessor. So if we would do the math, we see that one streaming multiprocessor can handle 32 warps. And basically uh, what it does is it always activates one warp at a time. So basically they are swapped. There are several methods on how this could work, uh, but basically most simple to explain is, for example, see our example of uh, accessing the memory for our, uh, for our image, uh, for our vector set we have added. So basically we have 32 uh, threads that are currently executed in a warp. And basically what these 32 threads do is they request some memory because they need like each thread needs four floating point values to uh, get the vector A that we had last video. So basically what this would do, the three multiprocess would see, ah, all right, I need some memory. I need, uh, because threads are like grouped behind each other, it basically has a starting address, for example, like zero, and then it goes up to uh, not 32 because we uh, are having four floats per vector. So we would have uh, uh, 128. So it would know, all right, I need memory from zero to 128. You would multiply this again because we are having float values which are bigger than, uh, than one byte, but actually we are here on a 32-bit processor. So this is kind of like optimized if we are doing this in, in groups of 32 bits. So basically what we would do, we would request these 128 floats and this would then go out to the memory units. And normally on a CPU, you would have a memory stall. So basically now your CPU would sit idle and wait until this memory is ready. But the GPU now has multiple warps. So what the GPU does is says, all right, this one warp is currently waiting for memory. Good, I'm gonna swap this out for the next warp that can now do its computations while the uh, other warp is fetching or the G other GPU hardware is fetching memory. So the next warp comes in, executes the same instruction, needs to load some data, notifies the memory units, I want some data. The GPU says, all right, we would have a stall, so take the next warp. And now we would kind of like hop from warp to warp to warp to warp to warp, all fetching, calling their memory fetches out to the GPU until we are, have reached the last warp. And now we are jumping back to the first warp which eventually already got its memory ready. So basically while we post all the other requests, the first memory bytes, bytes are already coming in and the memory for that first warp is ready. So that warp can see, all ah, right, I have that memory. I can copy this into my register files. Boom, I have it. Or it might already have been copied in the register files. I mean, like this is all GPU architecture that could be implemented however, but that's just a theory how it works. And basically then I can continue executing, fetch some next memories, the next swap comes in, already got its memory, requests more memory, until we are begin, uh, back again at the top, which then can say, all right, I have both of my memory stuff ready, I can do the addition, now I want to write memory back, oh, I have a memory stall, swap next swap, does its addition, writes memory back, until we are done with that block and the streaming multiprocessor has finished executing that. So to recap, a thread block, 
is grouped into warps, warps of 32 threads, and the uh, GPU swaps the warps or the streaming multiprocessor swaps the warps uh, on demand how they require it to use it. And now we are coming to the grid that we already discussed, so the grid of blocks. The grid is run by the complete GPU unit. So basically uh, we have the full grid for our execution that needs to be done and basically what the GPU does, it takes this grid, it schedules this with other grids that might uh, request operation, for example like the Windows desktop is also using the GPU so it might be that the Windows uh, desktop is also having some, some kernel grids that are scheduled on the GPU with maybe a higher priority because it's the Windows desktop and the scheduler of the GPU would say alright I have these certain kernel grids that are uh, scheduled, alright this shading multiprocessor now executes this kernel grid, this this kernel's thread block, now this shading multiprocessor gets the other one. Oh, I have a half occup uh, occupied uh, shading streaming multiprocessor, so the half of the memory is free, the half of the uh, warps are free. Ah, I can group these two, uh, these two blocks together and execute them on the same streaming multiprocessor, so basically this is how the GPU works. So we have a thread that runs on a core, we have a full thread block that is scheduled on one streaming multiprocessor and all of our blocks that are in our grid are eventually executed on our GPU, mm, I don't know on which streaming multiprocessor, on any of them. Alright, so this was a bit complicated but I hope it gave some nice insight on how this work on the GPU uh, is done and I personally think if you have understand this it is better to imagine what you are doing and it's easier to write your QR code so this is somewhat important. I do want to go a bit off topic because now many people would come up and say hey but how does that fit with other APIs I mean the GPU can do also do ray tracing or texture sampling or they have video encoder and decode integrated in that how does that work? Well I don't know because like this could be implemented by each vendor differently. For example, NVIDIA has ray tracing cores uh, that do ray tracing, hardware accelerated. There might also be some units that are specially built for video encode and decode. There might be a unit that is specialized for rasterizing, or there might be a unit for the AMD example that does ray tracing in its compute cores. So ray tracing on AMD and CUDA cores is a bit of a, yeah, uh, explanation you shouldn't do because like CUDA, NVIDIA and AMD, no, nah, it doesn't work like that. But uh, basically, um, we don't care. Basically, an API is just a contract between the GPU's driver and the operating system or the API's vendor. So for example, if Microsoft says, all right, our DirectX API for a rasterizer that calculates uh, which pixel are covered by a triangle looks like this. So basically, I'm going to pass this information to the GPU. And this is just a contract. How the GPU implements this is a different story. So basically, NVIDIA could go, go in and say, all right, we have that so amazing uh, CUDA course. We're going to write a CUDA program that that's rasterizing. They can do this. So basically they take the data that's coming in from DirectX and send it send this data to their own like CUDA kernel that do does rasterizing. Or they might have implemented a specialized hardware that does rasterizing. So a special kind of like silicon that is very good for interpolating data. And in case this is the case, Basically, NVIDIA knows, all right, I have this special GPU, so our, my special purpose hardware is mapped to that like memory range of my GPU, or this is how I trigger that special operation on my GPU, and then it basically kicks off its own custom hardware that does rasterizing and brings back the pixels that shall execute it. So this is like all not defined. So Microsoft doesn't care how the GPU is going to do this. This is why there are also like good good uh, do's and don'ts like on the NVIDIA side, how to write DirectX 12 code good for NVIDIA hardware. And on AMD side, it might be totally different. This is why games that are like sponsored by NVIDIA might perform better on NVIDIA GPUs than AMD CP GPUs because like, well, if they are sponsored by NVIDIA, they're going to optimize their code so that it runs as fast as possible on an NVIDIA GPU. And writing code or optimizing code for NVIDIA might make it slower on AMD because you're feeding the data in like how NVIDIA has designed the hardware and if AMD has designed the hardware a bit different then it might be less efficient if it runs on an AMD GPU. So this is just how it works. You don't have unified memory, that uh, unified hardware that's all behaving the same. And basically another thing for example like on 3D uh, graphic APIs shaders 
are basically executed on CUDA cores. How this works is actually quite simple. If you compile a shader, it's, gonna com it's being compiled to a DXIL, so a DirectX intermediate language, which is basically like a assembler program with, with kind of like a defined language. And basically what, what, what DirectX is gonna do, it's gonna validate this uh, intermediate layer code and it's gonna send this to the driver. And the driver then knows how to take this intermediate code and uh, bring it to a uh, to a graph to, to a format where the NVIDIA graphic card or AMD graphic card can understand this. So basically, if you're gonna write the DirectX 12 shader, it is turned into some CUDA equivalent by the driver. I mean, it's already have been compiled by a compiler, so it's basically already an assembler language and it's basically just assembled. Or it's actually not disassembled because it is kind of like a disassembly, but yeah, basically it's going to be disassembled back to a text form. And then the driver is taking that and bringing that in into the like CUDA assembler. This is how I, this is, is working. Yeah, that was quite some bunch today. But I think it was quite beneficial so that you understand how things work. In the next video, we're going to do some image processing. We're going to convert a colored image to a black and white image. So yeah, stay tuned. See you in the next video. Make sure to like and subscribe and see you in the next one. Bye.